please join me in welcoming Bob Barr. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Thank you very much. It is uh, it is a, a great pleasure and an honor to to be here with uh, with Brenda and and with uh, Rogers and so many uh, good friends of sometimes many many years. Uh, I was delighted to uh, see my uh, colleague Jim Diker here. He and I worked uh, together. Uh, he did the actual work. I just sat around an office and signed off on papers that he would present to me when he was the organized crime uh, strike force attorney here in Atlanta uh, and now one of our uh, areas, uh, states, regions, most uh, preeminent attorneys, uh, a uh, honor that he shares, I know, with Craig Dowdy, another friend and great lawyer of many years, and so many other folks here. Um, and then there's Mike McDougal here, uh, down, down here, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the mouth of the South, uh, one of the great uh, broadcasters uh, in our state's uh, history. I have to tell, uh, I haven't even had a chance to, to chat with Mike today, but Yesterday, I had an opportunity to speak to a couple of journalism classes, uh, dare I say it, at the University of Georgia uh, Journalism School, not the one that you're closely associated with. But uh, we uh, were doing, speaking at uh, the classes uh, there, and then we did a, an interview for the uh, journalism school's uh, television uh, station there. And uh, yeah, Mike's one of those fellows like Fred Aiken, who's sitting next to him, uh, who worked in our congressional office for many years. And I swear, and I've, I've told Fred this before, that no matter where we went in the 7th uh, Congressional District during the eight years that I had the honor of representing uh, that part of West Georgia, you uh, could be assured that you would find somebody that either knew or more likely was related to Fred Aiken, uh, which wasn't as amazing as the fact that they all still liked him. Uh, it, it was absolutely amazing. Mike is the same way, and we were over at the University of Georgia uh, yesterday, Mike, and darn it, there weren't some students and faculty over there that knew you. Uh, uh, they said, didn't Rome used to be in, in, in your district? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, you must know Mike McDougall. Uh, I do. And probably the nicest uh, thing about having been in politics over the years is the wonderful people uh, that you meet. Uh, and uh, you benefit from their reputation. Uh, you go somewhere and people's face light up and you have instant credibility whether you deserve it or not, because you know a Fred Aiken or, or a Mike McDougald or something. And it, and it really is wonderful that that, uh, even now being out of at least the electoral side of politics, none of us are out of politics completely or we wouldn't be here, uh, but uh, even now to uh, continue to benefit from those great friendships and the credibility of, of such great people uh, as uh, you have here today. Uh, it. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here to talk about a topic, as, as Brenda was kind enough to mention, uh, consumes a great deal of my time, did consume a great deal of my time when I had the honor of serving in the Congress, uh, including eight years, the entire time that I was in the Congress, on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and that is uh, also uh, the, the, the notion of privacy and civil liberties, uh, which has always been at the core of what I have and probably all of us here as uh, conservatives and individuals uh, very concerned about public policy by the nature of the organization's name and what it stands for. We're all concerned about uh, public policy. Uh, and part of that public policy, of course, is striking that balance, uh, probably the most difficult one that any society has to strike, between government power uh, and personal liberty. Uh, we know, unlike uh, other cultures, other societies, other countries, other regions of the world, we know that uh, government gets its power from one place and one place only, and that is from the people. Uh, a fact, though, that uh, seems to escape a lot of our friends out there who aren't associated with the Georgia Public Policy Foundation and similar organizations that constantly talk about and study and educate people as to these important philosophical foundations of our society. Uh, far too many of our fellow citizens, when they look at issues uh, even that involve uh, directly privacy, uh, all they see is the outward signs of something. Well, they're concerned about getting phone calls uh, that they don't want to get. They're concerned uh, with uh, what happens with their check when it goes through the bank. Uh, they might be concerned about this, that, or the other thing. They focus on that either get angry about it and don't do anything about it or try and work on that one particular aspect of it and often sort of lose sight of the forest for the trees, lose sight of the important philosophical foundation uh, that privacy uh, 
uh, represents. Privacy is more than simply what happens to pieces of paper. Uh, it is about more than simply what happens to particular uh, bits of information. Uh, privacy is the most fundamental of all freedoms. It is the foundation of all freedoms. And I, and I frequently think back, and I was reminded of this just the other day, I had a, a visit in my office here in Atlanta uh, from uh, a gentleman from the West Coast uh, who was uh, here speaking to, I think, an ROTC program at, uh, at Emory uh, uh, to Monday or Tuesday evening whenever he was in town. And he is the uh, uh, the executive director and president of the Ayn Rand Institute, uh, and he uh, travels around the country talking about the uh, philosophy and the ideas of uh, one of the 20th centuries, in my view, 20th century's great philosophers, uh, Ayn Rand. Uh, and we talked a little bit about it, and I frequently refer to her in uh, discussions in which I'm involved, or town hall meetings, or debates, or whatnot, because Ayn Rand uh, recognized the absolute fundamental importance of privacy rights and the notion of privacy not just to America but to civilization itself. I'm frequently, I frequently go back, for example, and read uh, a discourse in one of her books, The Fountainhead, which was published uh, back, I think, in the 1940s. It predated Atlas Shrugged. But in, in that book, and some of you may, may have read it, be familiar with it, or familiar with the, the movie that came out, I think it was back in the 50s sometime with Gary Cooper. It's an excellent movie. But uh, in, that, in that book, and the notion of the book is very simple. Uh, you have a gentleman by the name of Rourke uh, who is a, uh, uh, an architect, and he designs, pursuant to contract, he designs a building for uh, a, uh, a business, a large business enterprise. Uh, they, what happens, though, is the building is changed dramatically into something both in terms of its physical characteristics and what it is to be used for, something very different from what he envisioned and what he put on paper, his ideas. And he dynamites the building. He destroys the building. And for that, he is prosecuted. And it's very interesting because he does something that I know uh, Craig and Jim and the other lawyers in the room uh, would never counsel somebody to do, and that is to serve as their own attorney. Uh, but he does in this, uh, in this novel serve as his own attorney, and at the conclusion of the prosecution's case, when the defense normally then presents its evidence uh, in rebuttal uh, to uh, the uh, evidence that the prosecution has presented or an affirmative defense or whatever, he gets up and he calls no witnesses, does not produce one piece of evidence, and goes directly to his closing argument. That's his entire case. And if you go back, if you have a few minutes, it's not terribly long, even though I don't think uh, Ayn Rand ever wrote a book that was under about a thousand pages, but this particular part of that novel, The Fountainhead, toward the end where Mr. Rourke makes his, both his case and closing argument to the jury, uh, has within it some, some, some real gems of current philosophical importance. And one of them is his discussion to the jury of the importance of privacy. And he talks about privacy in a way that far too few people do, but we really ought to. And even if we don't talk about it this way, to constantly keep it in mind as we look at the assaults on privacy uh, being committed by not just our government, but international bodies such as the United Nations, which I shudder to even think about it, wants to take over control of the Internet, something that we ought to oppose with every fiber of our intellectual being. Uh, but we need to think about the notion of privacy as the essence of civilization, as Ayn Rand says uh, through, uh, through the, the words of the protagonist in this book, that she said, if you look at it, he, she said, if you look at it, uh, really the march toward civilization is the march to set men free from men. Uh, to recognize, unlike the pre-civilized society, what she referred to as the, the tribal society governed by the law of the tribe, in which there is no such thing, no recognition of the principle or the fact of private property. Ideas are not owned by you, they are controlled and owned by the tribe, communally. Physical property, assets in the pre-civilized society, likewise. You have no right to personalize justice. It is all communal, decided by the group at large. Uh, and it was only as people many, many, many years ago developed the notion and the deep innate feeling that as a human being, 
I have a right to my ideas, and my ideas may be reflected uh, in physical assets, physical things, or intangible ideas. And it was when we started developing that notion that there is a sense of justice that attaches and a right to justice that attaches to each person and that we each have a right to control our property uh, that mankind started advancing beyond that sort of primitive or quasi-primitive state. And she talks about uh, the notion through her uh, character in this novel, that notion of privacy as being not just the essence of what our nation stands for, but of civilization itself. And I think it's a, it's a notion that our founding fathers recognized and understood as well. The word privacy doesn't appear in the Constitution. Most of the important uh, words that uh, give voice to the principles of our country and our freedom don't appear in the Constitution. By its very nature, the Constitution is not supposed to be a catalog of all of the things that we are and the, and the rights that we enjoy. It's there to define the role of government and to place limitations on the power of government. Even though the, no, the word privacy nowhere appears in the Constitution, I don't think that any uh, intelligent person who understands what our country, what our society, what our civilization is about could help but reach the conclusion when looking, for example, at the Bill of Rights uh, that the notion of privacy is at their core. The whole idea that you have ideas, be they religious or political ideas, that are deserving of protection, uh, whether it is your individual ideas or your right to assemble, to petition, uh, that presumes and is based on the notion of privacy. Uh, you have your right to your ideas and they are to be protected. Without a notion of privacy, that would have no meaning. Even the Second Amendment, another amendment dear, near and dear to my heart as a board member of the National Rifle Association, even the Second Amendment you see embodied in it and as a foundation the notion of privacy. If you did not have, if we did not have as children of God living in a free society, uh, the right to our ideas, our property to be protected, the notion of the right to keep and bear arms would have no meaning. We wouldn't need it in the Constitution because there'd be nothing to protect. It also presumes and assumes and is founded on the notion of privacy rights. And I think more than any other, of course, we have the Fourth Amendment under assault as never before in our nation's history as a result of the mindset of 9-11 in which fear, rather than good public policy, uh, has taken over as the medium of exchange, I think, for so much of what Washington and indeed other governments do. The Fourth Amendment essentially embodies that notion of privacy, which is the, the, the sine qua non of, Craig can tell you what that means after luncheon, of civilization itself. Uh, the Fourth Amendment says, I think, very clearly that each one of us is surrounded, clothed in a sphere of privacy. And government cannot pierce that veil of privacy, that sphere of privacy, unless it has a good reason for doing so. I think you know, all the clutter aside, that's essentially what we're talking about here. We're not saying that the government doesn't have a right to certain information, that the government doesn't have a right in appropriate circumstances to gather evidence that can be used against us to fulfill other essential government purposes. But we are saying, and the Fourth Amendment, as I, as I believe, is perfectly clear on this, the government has to have a reasonable basis before it can invade that privacy. And that really has been, up until 9-11, up until the USA Patriot Act, essentially the way our government has operated. It hasn't always operated smoothly. Sometimes it requires lengthy court proceedings to get us back to that principle. But eventually, uh, that always has occurred. We are in danger of losing that. And if we lose that essential right to privacy, by allowing, for example, the government under the USA Patriot Act to continue to get, gather evidence that can be used against U.S. citizens without any reasonable basis to suspect or to believe that those citizens have done something wrong, then we have indeed destroyed the very foundation of the Fourth Amendment and with it the whole notion of privacy is the bedrock of our society and civilization. That's why these debates are so very important. It's more, it's about much more than just the physical indices of making sure that our names don't get on a particular watch list or to make sure that the government doesn't interfere with our right to contract uh, because they're so concerned that at some point maybe in the distant future uh, 
uh, somebody that we have been associated with even unknowingly might be connected with some organization that some bureaucrat in Washington has decided ought to be on some watch list or whatever. It's about the fundamental principle of privacy here. And also, I know there's another very important issue that we all deal with in, in, in uh, both our jobs and our intellectual pursuits and uh, through our uh, work with the foundation here, and that is the notion of property rights. Uh, property rights uh, really are sort of a subset of the notion of privacy. It's, it's a particular type of privacy right. And I think here, too, we have an important job as advocates for privacy rights and property rights and constitutional rights generally through the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. I think we have an obligation here, too, not just ourselves to remember what property rights are. They are the essence of the advance of civilization. Those civilizations that have fallen, including some Western civilizations, uh, inevitably, I suspect, I've not done all the research on this, but knowing just a, a little bit about it, which I know can be dangerous, I suspect that you will find somewhere in there moves by the government to denigrate, if not take away, the right to own and keep and control property. That usually uh, presages a downfall of a society. We saw it uh, in microcosm. Uh, when uh, the Brits, uh, the British government, uh, came down on the, on the Irish. Uh, Mike could tell you a lot more about this, uh, being a, a, a student of uh, the history of Europe and England and Scotland. Uh, but uh, when one of the ways that the British, uh, the Crown, uh, was able to gain essentially absolute control over the Irish uh, was to take away the right to own, keep, and control property. Uh, and that in turn caused a great migration of uh, the Irish to the United States. That was one reason among, among several. Uh, we benefit greatly from Britain's mistake. But we see that also in other parts of the world where the culture is very, very different and the notion of property rights are not protected. And uh, it is one reason, I think, among several why the United States of America remains the only superpower on the face of the earth is because of our respect for property rights and the notion of property and, as a subset, the notion of privacy. And that's why what, what is happening in Washington, uh, and it's not just the Bush administration, it's government generally, uh, to gain more and more control over people by gaining more and more and telling us that it has the right to gain more and more information about us and over us uh, is of such great concern and ought to be to all of us, whether we think of or work of the manifestations that in terms of intellectual property uh, or physical properties, property as developers or, or whatnot, it is, it is simply that important. Uh, and while it sometimes might be uh, a nice or satisfy the concerns of a particular constituency uh, for our public officials uh, to uh, work to uh, tweak uh, some state laws uh, to add a little more regulation. Uh, well, we're concerned about water runoff here, so we'll, we'll limit development here. We don't like the kind of houses that uh, the private parties are developing, so we're going to put some just some minor limitations uh, on the type of homes or where you can build them. Uh, we're concerned about uh, water usage, so we're going to tell people uh, how much water can be flushed through a toilet system. Well, we're concerned about the rights of the handicapped, so we're going to tell home builders what kind of doorknobs they can put on their homes. Each one of those might not appear terribly important in and of itself. But if we remind people, if we remind our legislatures, and Republican legislatures need reminding of this just as badly as Democrat legislators do, that every time they seek to do that, they are inevitably diminishing property rights and privacy rights in this, uh, in this state, or if it's a federal issue, uh, in this country. Uh, and that does not mean the government should not sit back and do nothing, but it does mean, I think, that there ought to be a much more pointed and extensive debate over these issues uh, than normally precedes or, or accompanies them. And I think we also need to finally pay very close attention to, uh, as Brenda mentioned, uh, the, whole, the whole notion of the privacy of information. Uh, that in, indeed, information is really the currency of the 21st century. Uh, in, in decades and centuries past, uh, the might of a nation was measured more uh, either in gold uh, or in geographic scope or natural resources. 
Now it's much more measured in terms of information, the ability to uh, develop, gain, maintain, aggregate, and use information. That is really where the control of both nations and corporations uh, is going to continue to be, I think, for the, the foreseeable future. And therefore, we have uh, a particular uh, need to pay attention to how we deal with that. And it's easy, of course, to, uh, to engage in sort of a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, Choice Point uh, uh, has a problem with, uh, with somebody stealing some of the na information, uh, so we're going to control Choice Point, or we're going to control all data aggregating firms or data management firms. Uh, without really giving a lot of thought to where is that going to lead us if, for example, uh, we decide that we're going to place all sorts of restrictions on those companies that engage in the collection, management, and use of data, uh, then we're going to make it uh, uneconomical for them to operate. And what will happen? They'll go abroad, and then you lose all control over it. So there's a, a fine balance here that I think we need to strike, uh, uh, guarding against an overreaction, but recognizing that it is fundamentally important here, too, uh, to protect the privacy of information, not just because of the information itself, but because of the principles that are really at stake in, in what we're talking about here. Uh, Rogers and Brenda, uh, does that sort of set the stage well enough? Were there some other areas you'd like me to touch on or just sort of open, open it up for uh, a discussion or some, some questions? And if I could get a little bit of iced tea, that would be tremendous. Uh, Good point, and it's one of the, uh, and I suspect, and I know you all have uh, some other folks uh, that speak from time to time that, that are actually in public office, unlike us tired old former public uh, servants, uh, and I suspect that if you ask them, particularly uh, some of my former colleagues in the House or our, or our senators, they probably would tell you uh, the same thing that I would hear over and over and over again from particularly, not, ju not just from homeowners, but uh, from our Department of Transportation folks, our uh, Georgia DOT folks, uh, not just the, the aggravation and the cost and the restrictions on individual homeowners being able to develop their property uh, the way they see fit, uh, but also the cost and time that these so-called historic designations add to the development of roadways in our state. Uh, it's another example of the tail wagging the dog uh, in many respects. And we would have these meetings on a pretty regular basis with the state uh, uh, DOT folks who would come up to Washington and meet with uh, the members of our, of our congressional delegation and, and our staffs. And they would show us these pictures of historic, historically designated edifices, uh, structures uh, throughout Georgia. And you'd look at these, and, and literally, they would be like old outhouses, uh, some of them. Uh, just old shacks that somebody uh, recognizes, uh, hey, if we designate this as a historic landmark, or whatever the designation might be, we can stop a road from going through our area. Uh, and it happens over and over and over again. Uh, part of the problem is federal, part of it is state, and part of it is local. And it's because these ideas take hold that sound great on the surface. We want to preserve historically significant structures. Uh, and you develop and, and, and start funding a bureaucracy to ensure that that, uh, that, that happens. And darn if doesn't happen uh, to it, uh, what happens to virtually every taxpayer-funded uh, bureaucracy, and this is one of Bob Barr's laws of the universe, it grows. They never, ever shrink. They always grow. Uh, and we tried uh, when uh, the Republicans first uh, took over the majority of the House in January of 1995 to do away with at least some of these bureaucracies up there. Uh, we were singularly unsuccessful. Now, maybe that was partly our fault, the way we went about it or whatnot, but uh, it is extremely, extremely difficult, almost impossible, not quite, but almost impossible to get rid of these things once they start. The force of the status quo is indeed the most powerful force in the universe. So we've got to stop these things before they get started because it becomes almost impossible afterwards. But we should be able to do something about it at the state level. I'm, I'm surprised that we haven't uh, been. I know we have a lot of folks here that wield great influence down there, and uh, hopefully uh, we can at least get that done at the state level because I don't know what we, you know, we just don't seem to be able to get anywhere up in Washington, even with the Congress and the White House controlled by uh, a supposed uh, conservative party.
So uh, it's a good question, and could be, and could it could apply equ equally to sort of a separate but related issue, and that is uh, the the NSA spying that's that's being debated greatly. Uh, it was on Monday this week. The Attorney General testified uh, pretty much all day on the issue of NSA spying. The President addressed it in a State of the Union. So the two issues, I think, the answer uh, can be uh, very similar. The USA Patriot Act. Uh, is an important piece of legislation. I voted for it. I wouldn't vote for it if it weren't important. <laughs> it's sort of a non sequitur, but I voted for the USA Patriot Act, as did most of uh, members of the House, and I think all but one member of the U.S. Senate at the time. And, but a lot of us did it with some serious concerns about it. We wanted to see how it operated. There were some many provisions in the USA Patriot Act that were and are very beneficial and entirely consistent with constitutional norms and, and other laws. But there are a handful of provisions in the USA Patriot Act that are very constitutionally problematic, uh, particularly the way some of them have been used far beyond what we intended and Congress intended when it passed them. What I and a number of others from really the right and the left and the center of the ideological spectrum, I mean, this is an issue that brings together the ACLU and the American Conservative Union and Eagle Forum and Americans for Tax Reform, for example. What we are urging is not a wholesale uh, discarding of the USA Patriot Act, even though some of us would like to start over again and do a better job with it, which is what I think we ought to do with a lot of federal laws, uh, you know, sunset them and then redo them after the passage of several years so we can see how they're working and so they don't you know, just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But what we are urging is that we reestablish that important link between the power of the government to gain access to personal private information and a reasonable suspicion that the person on whom they're seeking that information has actually done something <coughs> wrong. And that might be simply associating with a, with a terrorist or a suspected terrorist. It might be working on behalf of, even without pay, for a foreign entity or a foreign power. It might be violating one of our criminal laws. But at least require in the law itself that before the government can go to a firearm shop and uh, gather uh, evidence on what firearms we've purchased or go to our doctor's office and find out what we've done there or go to the library and find out what books we've uh, checked out or whatever or websites we visited that before the government do that at le have at least a reasonable suspicion that we've done something wrong along those lines of associating with terrorists violating our criminal laws or whatnot I think if we did that one, it would not impair in any meaningful way the ability of the government to do what it really needs to be doing, and that is doing a good job of identifying the real threats and not worrying about all of the other clutter, the, the other millions of bits of information that they're scooping up through these programs, 99% of which is absolutely useless, but yet sits there in the government depository of information if they ever do want to use it. That's not a good reason to do it. So that's really, in essence, what we want to do is reinvigorate that link that has always been there between suspicion of bad actions and violating a person's privacy and gathering evidence against them. With regard to the, to the NSA spying, it, it really is somewhat mystifying why the administration is doing what it's doing without following the law, because the law allows the government, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, to do exactly what it says it wants to do, exactly what it says it's doing, and exactly what it ought to be doing. They just don't want to go to a court to get permission because I think that would be an implicit admission on their part that there indeed are limits on what the president can do, what any president can do, serving as, in his mind, commander-in-chief. Uh, I don't think our Constitution, in providing that the president serves as commander-in-chief, meant to clothe him with power to decide what the commander-in-chief does including ignoring U.S. law simply because the President decides on a particular day he's going to serve as Commander-in-Chief. The Commander-in-Chief, our armed forces still operate according to our laws and if we get away from that uh, we're going down an awfully slippery slope awfully quickly. We find it in the legislation itself. Can everybody hear the, the question? I think we find it, the balance in the, le the legislative proposal itself. The legislative proposal simply recognizes, I think, Im impliedly uh, at least, that there is a federally guaranteed universal right to keep and bear arms in this country. That is in the Constitution and, and we have the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, 
Uh, it also, though, recognizes property rights. It does not require a business to allow a person to bring a firearm into that business. It does, though, strike, I think, a, a good balance. It simply recognizes that in a person's private property, their car or their pickup truck, maybe they have a gun rack, maybe they keep a firearm in, in the trunk of their car during hunting season. That's really the main reason why this is of concern to a lot of folks uh, in Georgia in particular. It recognizes that that is the person's car and that they have a right as long as they are, they are not disabled from possessing a firearm. They're not a convicted felon, uh, for example. Uh, and that uh, they can indeed keep that firearm in their property, in their car, uh, when they come to work and use a, use a parking lot. Uh, it draws, I think, a proper line and that it does not require the employer to allow the person to bring the firearm onto property, because that indeed, I think, does join uh, several important rights and interests that the, that the, that the employer has to protect the, uh, the workplace and the other employees there. But as long as the person with the firearm lawfully possessed in their private vehicle is not misusing it or threatening person, uh, threatening other people, uh, I think it's entirely appropriate, particularly with the way some companies in some jurisdictions now are uh, uh, firing employees simply because the employee uh, has a firearm that's not bothering anybody in the trunk of their car during hunting season, for example. I think that is an improper exercise of power by an employer. I think it is in contravention to the intent and the language of the Second Amendment. And I think the Georgia legislature, if they pass this legislation, and I don't know whether they will or not, I think strikes a good balance. I frankly have never really quite understood the right, either the right to an abortion or the right to life as a privacy right. I view it as uh, a more of a, a criminal matter, protection of life, uh, similar to our homicide laws. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the judge, of course, uh, you know, stayed away from a lot of the specific discussions of that, as, as he did uh, with, with most issues. But to me, uh, incorporating and considering the, the notion of right to life or right to abortions on the, on the other side, as the other side would put it, uh, as a privacy right, I think gets us into some, some very troubling areas that I've never really understood why we want to get into that. To me, it's a much simpler issue, much clearer to deal with and much more appropriate to deal with if you simply look at uh, a, a fetus as a human being. We have clearly and have always recognized laws against the taking, uh, the improper uh, taking of life in this country. And it was really only when we went uh, sort of away from that uh, in, uh, in Roe v. Wade, looking at, at, looking at it as a right to privacy and sort of divorcing ourselves from the morality of the, of the, of the human life that we got into uh, uh, this never-ending debate. So I'd, I've never seen that really in, uh, as, as a privacy right per se. Maybe I'm wrong, but, but that's, that's the way I've looked at it. The, uh, we are, in fact, moving toward, very rapidly, toward a national ID, uh, something which, with, which bothers me greatly. Uh, we've, uh, up to this point, have always been a nation where the, 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 the mechanism of providing identification, primarily through driver's licenses, for example, has been a function of the state government. Uh, states have been free to establish uh, the, the criteria uh, for recognizing and allowing people to drive on, on, the, on the roadways of that particular state, ensuring a certain degree of public safety and education and so forth. Uh, and we've never allowed up to very recently, and there are some troubling cases that are starting to develop to the contrary now, we've never allowed or recognized the right of the federal government to demand uh, a person identify themselves by identification uh, documents simply because the government wants to know who you are and where you are. We're now getting to that point. There was a case in, uh, it may have been Denver, but don't hold me to that. It was, it was out west somewhere, uh, I think a couple of months ago, in which a, a woman was on a, on a city bus, had paid the airfare, the, uh, the fare for the bus, was going from point A to point B. En route, the bus passed through a federal office complex. Uh, and the bus was forced to stop 
armed federal uh, officers came on the bus and demanded that everybody on the bus show identification. There apparently was no threat whatsoever. There was no intelligence that indicated some sort of threat. Uh, and uh, she was, this particular lady, was not getting off and going into the federal building. She was just on the bus going through this area. Uh, she refused to show identification and was arrested, and her case is, is still pending. Uh, I think if we go down that, that road, uh, it will, if not the death knell, uh, certainly uh, part of the death knell of, of any right to privacy that we have left, uh, recognizing that the federal government, for no good reason, uh, there's no threat, there's no information that you're posing a threat or that others in the immediate area might be posing a threat. You are not entering a federal facility, which would clearly, I think, give the federal government, as the landlord, so to speak, of that building, the right to ensure that you don't have weapons to bring in there. If none of that's present, why in heaven's name should the federal government be able to demand identification and arrest you, take away your liberty, your freedom, if you don't comply uh, with their request? Uh, we're moving in that direction. There is legislation pending called the Real ID Act uh, and uh, government uh, agencies under the uh, leadership of the TSA Transportation Security Administration have already held a series of meetings to begin drafting, implementing regulations for this Real ID Act. Even though it, is, uh, it does not call the Real ID a national ID, that's what it is. The federal government now, as, as a result of this legislation, well, to tell Georgia and every other one of the states in the District of Columbia who you can issue a driver's license to, what information it has, what form that information must be in, if it contains an RFID, radio frequency identifier chip, what sort of biometric identification information, and in what form it has to be on there, uh, and who can have access to your uh, driver's license information. Uh, this worries me greatly. Uh, from and I've sat in on some of these meetings where the uh, agencies are considering what regulations to uh, develop to implement this and they're talking very clearly uh, about moving in the direction of accessing all sorts of different databases incorporating those into the real ID database firearms purchase records for example criminal records misdemeanor records financial information all sorts of stuff would be incorporated in the, in these and yet what we're doing at the same time we're still turning a blind eye to the entire issue that uh, gives rise to your and my concern in the first place and that is uh, illegal immigration uh, if the government focused on what it ought to focus on not you know gathering information on everybody in the hopes that somehow they'll find out who the bad guys are but let's focus on the bad guys to begin with let's focus on on beefing up our border protection let's focus uh, on making sure that persons who come into this country lawfully who are not yet citizens or not yet permanent resident aliens have uh, a ID card that is required uh, to be kept uh, and that is properly database-based. Uh, if they want to enter this country lawfully and work here lawfully, then I believe that it is entirely appropriate for the federal government to require of them, not of me as a, as a lawful citizen of this country, that they do have an identification that must be shown when, uh, when requested by federal authorities because that is a federal interest within the jurisdiction of the government controlling immigration into our country uh, and so forth. That's one thing. We're not doing that here again. What we're focusing on is not the bad guys. We're focusing on all of us. We're being forced to give up our liberty, our freedom, our privacy simply because the government doesn't have the uh, backbone to tackle the real problem and, and this is an argument that I have with a lot of folks up in Washington and, and I hope we all pay attention to it. I think the, the Kilo v. City of New London decision was one of the worst decisions by our Supreme Court in many many years and that says something if you look at some of their decisions. Uh, I think it was, it was terrible and I think it's very very damaging. I know that the court sort of left the door open for uh, state legislatures uh, and I, I, I think also local legislatures, local government bodies to address the issue, uh, but that's not the way our system should operate. We shouldn't have the Supreme Court taking away a right uh, that is for us to be able to use our property as long as we don't endanger somebody else and as long as it's subject to reasonable zoning restrictions, uh, that we have to give that right up uh, and get it back only if we can then convince our local or state governments to give it back to us. I mean, that, that sort of turns this whole uh, notion of private property rights uh, on its head.
I'm glad to see that, that, that Georgia is among several states that are moving forward with uh, state legislation to more properly protect uh, property rights. I hope that they're serious about it and I hope that the legislation that Georgia passes really is meaningful uh, and has some real teeth in it. And I do hope that uh, there's another case that we can get up to the Supreme Court within the next few years hopefully that will give them an opportunity to, you know, to rectify, to change uh, uh, and uh, basically reverse the bad decision that they rendered uh, last uh, last summer, I think it was. But I, I think it's a very, very bad decision. I don't think there's any good light that you can put on it. 